All right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and uh, get started here. Uh, just off the top, uh, I want to welcome everybody once more. But before we get into the this, uh, this world premiere presentation, uh, just some logistics that I want to mention. Um, if you have questions, feel free to add those uh, into the uh, chat function, and I'll keep track of those, and we'll try to bring those back up for Joe toward the end of the presentation. We're going to ask that you keep yourselves muted. Um, I will continually uh, make sure that everybody's muted except for Joe. Um, also, this is being recorded to be featured on Matsall for uh, matsall.info for later viewing. So to that end, uh, I want to thank Brother Albert McClelland for his tireless work in promoting some Masonic education through his worldwide exemplification of Freemasonry and matsall.info, which uh, stands for Masonic Awareness at the Speed of Light. So our speaker this morning needs no introduction, but uh, skipping it would probably be a Masonic uh, offense, so unmasonic conduct. Uh, so Joe, Joseph Wages, 32nd degree Freemason. He's a member of the Blue Friars, member of Plano Lodge number 768, Fate Lodge 802, the Dallas Valley of Scottish Rite Freemasonry of the Southern Jurisdiction. He's a fellow of the Grand College of Rites, a fellow of the Philalethes, and a full member of the Texas Lodge of Research, Michigan Lodge of Research, and a life member of the Missouri Lodge of Research. He's editor of The Secret School of Wisdom, The Authentic Rituals and Doctrines of the Illuminati, a wonderful book, and on materialism and idealism, uh, more works by Adam Weishaupt. Uh, he is currently preparing uh, the forthcoming books, uh, Ecosse Masonry, A History of the High Degrees from the Scots Master to the Order of the Royal Secret uh, for the Scottish Rite Research Society, the Columbian Illuminati, the Improved System of the Illuminati. Uh, and so, Brother Joe, with that, you have control, and I will yield the controls to you. Uh, I'll monitor the chat and admission meeting, uh, admissions to the meeting, and I will talk to you guys all uh, when Joe is finished. So, Brother Joe, it is all yours. Well, thanks, Brother RJ. I uh, really appreciate you uh, taking time today to help uh, get this thing going, because if it was up to me, this uh, probably wouldn't have come off half as good. But in any case, I'm going to go ahead. If I, if I kick over, a uh, quick question, if I kick over share screen, will it show my picture or is it just slides only? So when you hit share screen, what it's going to do is ask you what you want to share. So you can ah. just share your desktop or you can click your PowerPoint window. Okay. Then what I'll do is this. Let's try this real quick. And you guys can see my screen, is that right? Yes, no. Let's go. Right, then we have the option, Joe, of whether we want to see speaker view or full screen or whatever, that the option shifts over to us. Understood. So can you guys see my screen now? Okay. <laughs> well, a few bumps and bruises, but let's get going then. Okay, brethren. Um, today's presentation is, let me pull this off to the side so it's not annoying. Is there a good way to do that? Uh, that's one. Okay. Yeah, so this presentation today is Frederick the Great and the Ancient Accepted Scottish Rite. Uh, as Brother RJ had mentioned, Brother uh, McClelland at, reached out to me and asked me to do this presentation. And foolishly, I said, yes, of course, I know plenty about this topic. And so here we are today. And, you know, this, the materials in this would probably make a really interesting paper. I think it translates better as an actual presentation because you can actually see the documents I'm talking about. So let's kind of kick it off and talk about the life of Frederick the Great. So Frederick was born on the 24th of January, 1712, died 17 of August, 1786. Um, he was he ruled the kingdom of Prussia from 1740 until his death in 1786. Um, one of the things to know about his reign is that he was in a way the opposite of his father. His father was very uh, rigid and kind of following the existing order of things. He was a very enlightened person, wanted to bring in the enlightenment. So a lot of his early decisions going on uh, were in contradiction to more or less like kind of rebelling against his father if that makes any sense. 
Um, but that being said, though, he, he fully embraced the role of the military. Um, he expanded the size of Prussia and reclaimed historic territories uh, within Prussia and united Brandenburg with Prussia. And what that means is, is you had he had basically two disconnected uh, pieces of land uh, that through a series of uh, wars from 1740 on, uh, he basically made them connect back together and made a contiguous state of Prussia while expanding its uh, boundaries. And so in 1772, um, he, he declared himself king of Prussia. And the mo most important thing that's really germane to this conversation today is that he was a patron of the arts, music, architecture, the Enlightenment, and moreover, Freemasonry. And one of the things that he also did is he uh, let the Enlightenment come in into Germany after the conclusion of the Seven Years' War in 1763 with this idea of enlightened absolutism. And what enlightened absolutism will be is uh, a series of agrarian land reforms, the abolition of serfdom, um, it, kind of some of the dis dis distribution of lands to be worked by the people. Most importantly, though, is education. And so we see... Um, you know, the Prussian Academy of Sciences and things like this spring up. And so really Germany in a lot of ways, uh, because of the wars that were going on during the uh, War of Austrian succession and then during the uh, Seven Years' War, they basically had a, a little bit later start at the Enlightenment. There weren't Enlightened thinkers. It's just it wasn't really embraced until the conclusion of hostilities for the simple fact that they can't. But for our purposes today, let's talk about Frederick the Great, the Freemason. What we know about his initiation is that he was initiated in secret. Now, normally I wouldn't read these slides, but I'm going to do it today because we're, you know, we're, we're, we're doing a recorded presentation here. So just bear with me for a second. And it says that uh, during a different conversation, his father, Friedrich Wilhelm I, uh, commented on Freemasonry and all secret societies on a trip to the Rhine in 1738. And Count Albert Wolfgang zu Schamburger Lippe disagreed and openly professed Freemasonry. This conversation at the table made such an impression on the young Crown Prince Frederick that he expressed to the Count his desire to become a Freemason. Graf zu Schamburg Lippe communicated the wish to the Freemason Friedrich Christian von Abdel, who reported to his lodge in Hamburg. Uh, the Lodge decided to send a deputation to Braunschweig, or Brunswick, uh, of which uh, Baron Oberg, master of the chair, was uh, included the brothers Lofen and Bielefeld uh, and the valets Oberg and Rabon. And at the night of August the 14th and 15th, 1738, the initiation took place in the Kornchen Inn on Breitenstrasse uh, at the same time as Friedrich, uh, Captain Leopold Alexander von Bartenspen was admitted and the labors lasted until about 4 a.m. So he receives all three degrees uh, this evening is basically our understanding of it. One of the things, though, is that there's not any kind of lodge records that commemorate this. So it begs the question, how do we know for certain that he was even initiated? Well, the great news is, is we have two letters um, that, that, that he kind of documents his, his initiation. So in this first one, he's writing to Crown Prince Frederick, uh, is writing to Count Albrecht Wolfgang of Schomburg Lippe uh, at Milan on the 26th of July, 1738. Now, this is right before he's initiated. And so what it says in the letter is that, I hope you will not repent of my reception. It will depend on your prudence to appoint me, not to the deputies of your brotherhood, as for the time I think I can tell you positively, the king has resolved to be at Salts Hall around the 10th next month. The fair will provide a plausible pretext for any foreigner to go there. And so what it is, is he's coordinating uh, his initiation because his father does not approve Freemasonry. We kind of discussed that he was at the table and didn't think too much of the society. And so kind of like what I mentioned before, like this is kind of the rebellious thing. It's like, oh, well, dad doesn't want to do this. And I definitely want to do this. And that's where we're going here. So the second letter that we have is, again, uh, Frederick writing to Count Albrecht Wolfgang zu Schamburg Lippe on September of 1738, and so this is right after his initiation. And so he says, I would like, if possible, to instill my memory in you in a way so sensitive that it would be almost impossible for you to forget me. 
It is for this purpose that I made this ring that I beg you to accept. It will remind you of the features of a friend and colleague of a respectable order of Freemasons and who preserves an infinite recognition of what you made him receive. So what ends up happening is that he, he makes him a token for his appreciation. So from Frederick's own mouth to the person that brought him into Freemasonry and so influenced him, he wanted to reward him with a ring that he had commissioned. I'm not certain if this ring exists today, but it would definitely be something worth looking to find. Okay, and so what we see here is an engraving that was done in 1785, and it's showing uh, Frederick the Great uh, sitting in as master of lodge. But most importantly, though, is that he was the patron of the Grand Lodge of the Three Globes, which was established on September 13th, 1740. And what we see here is a, a copy of like the minute book, you know, the first page on it. And it says uh, 13th of September, 1740. It's page one of their minute book. So basically, the kind of like now that we've established he's been initiated, like what was his actual connection to Freemasonry? Uh, and so what basically he does is uh, he forms the first lodge, the Lodge of the King, our Grand Master at Rheinsberg Castle with Olberg as master. We'd mentioned him before. Uh, he was one of the guys that was uh, part of his initiation. And basically he leads the lodge himself from June the 20, 1740 after his ascension to the crown. And so that's what that, um, we go back just a couple of slides. That's, that's what this engraving is commemorating right here. And so what ends up happening though, is that by September the 13th, 1740, they form a grand lodge um, and it's called the three globes, right? And that's, 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 that's what ends up happening here. And so You know, he doesn't really have very much activity beyond this or much interest in it. And so, uh, interestingly enough, uh, Pike pointed this out in uh, his thing when he when he wrote in, uh, I forget what year it was, but he, he did the thing with the Grand Constitutions. And this is one of the little footnotes that's inside of there, and I tracked it down to the uh, book itself. And so, basically, they're saying somewhere around 1755 to 1756, he ceased being a member. Not that he wasn't still a Mason, he just stopped going to lodge or having any interest. And so, it says that, you know, Frederick himself continued to belong to the order until after the Salesian War, and he ceased to be a member shortly before the commencement of the Seven Years' War, at the very time when these orders began to be abused by every species of deception. And he also commanded such of his ministers of state as belong to the order to desist from visiting their lodges. And what we're talking about here is really kind of like it's, it's presaging the rise of the strict observance, which really uh, doesn't get going full force uh, throughout Germany until about like the 1764 thereabouts. And they still existed prior to this, but they weren't really the dominant right in Germany at this point. So when they're talking about abuses and species of deception, they're talking about that. Uh, you know, they're talking about that legend that they're, they're connected to the Knights Templar and they're a direct descendant and a continuation, which, of course, uh, Baron von Huyn totally made up. And not from his own imagination. Uh, you know, a little side note here. He was initiated into a group called the uh, Sublime Elected Knights in uh, the 1740s. With the earliest record we have for that group, 1749. Um, and that's kind of like it's like a proto Knights Kadosh ritual. And so when he built his system, he built it in memory of this system, though it's not the same as the ritual, chiefly the Templar legend. Okay, so let's talk about the actual legend itself. And so with this this little uh, this little snippet here comes from a seventeen no, no sorry an 1819 French document. I translated it out here for you. I'm going to read it for you because it kind of encapsulates what the legend is we're talking about. And so it says, Charles Edward, the last descendant of the House of Stuart, Knight Grand Kadosh, was uh, by a concordant chief of all masonry, ancient and modern, and he appointed as Grand Master and his successor, Frederick II, King of Prussia. This wise king granted a singular protection to masonry, and in this epoch, some projects of innovation and dissension took place in Germany. These events made him fear that masonry would be changed into a fatal anarchy by those who, under the title of primitive masons endeavored to degrade and vilify it in order to ensure its destruction. 
Masonry already reckoned 32 degrees by reasons of the tribunals, which it was found necessary to create for the purpose of consolidating order and Masonic harmony. Frederick, foreseeing that the end of his life was approaching, conceived the high design of concentrating the sovereign Masonic powers with which he was invested in a council of a grand general inspectors in order that after his decease, they might regulate the high masonry according to the ancient constitutions, always preserving the order of degrees of the ancient establishment. So if we want to kind of summarize what happened here, um, he's basically talking about the so-called uh, primitive masons. And by primitive masons, he's talking about the order of the royal secret itself. And if we'll think back to Sir No here, that, that may be what's going on when they're talking about primitive masons. They're talking about the system prior to the ancient and accepted Scottish rite, the order of the royal secret. And so what they're saying is, is that he, get, he gives away his powers at his death so that way they can regulate the system themselves. And this is the legend we're talking about today. So basically, is Frederick the Great the head of the Scottish rite or was he and did he transfer his powers over? So it begs the question, is the story of Frederick the Great true? And the answer is no, it's a legend. <laughs> but the larger question, though, is where exactly does this legend come from? Like, how, how is it that they invent this? Is it out of whole cloth? Does a person come up with it on their own? Well, the answer is that its origins are found in the rituals themselves, and then it was turned into a legend. So we're going to go to my good friend here, the Balo Manuscript. Uh, one of the things that's important about this particular text is to uh, realize that it's the literal source ritual of the Franken Manuscripts. And we've got the uh, translations coming out with it. Um, and what we can do is we can basically say that this Balo Manuscript is not only owned by Stephen Marin, but that it was also in the possession of Henry Andrew Franken. And it's what he used to translate uh, the Franken and manuscripts themselves. And if you'll just be patient with us, by next year we'll have this uh, totally in print and you guys will probably really like it quite a bit. So this Balo manuscript, it's somewhere around 1763, 1764, based on things inside the text. Um, there are also additions. There's two Alu Cohen grades that were added in May 1768 at Fort au Prince. So here's the first uh, example of Frederick the Great being mentioned in there. And if you see the little highlighted part in French, it says the illustrious Frederick the Great of Brun Brunswick, King of Prussia, as there. And it's in the Prussian Knight degree. And again, all the things that we see here are going to be exactly the same in the Franken manuscripts as well. And so in English, it says the Grand Master General of the Order, known as the Knight Grand Commander, is the illustrious Frederick of Brunswick, King of Prussia. For some 300 years, his ancestors have been protectors of this order in which the Prussian knights celebrate the memory of the Tower of Babel or the descendants of Noah. And what we need to, what's important here is this ritual is also uh, published in uh, the plus secret mystère, like the most secret high uh, degrees of Freemasonry. It was a book that was published in the 1760s. The same little uh, kind of moniker linking it to Frederick the Great is also in there. And so if we think about uh, the Balo manuscript itself, not all, but some of the degrees are invented by Stephen Marin, but the vast majority of it are popular, are popular extant high degrees at the time. And so this is just another uh, proof of it that, that Frederick the Great's in here, but it's not because Stephen Marin put it here, it's because that legend already exists in the text. Okay, but there's another mention here in that text as well. Um, we'll skip down to the bottom here, um, and it's talking about the grips and the words, and it says that the first person turns the hand, the second while saying Frederick, the second person then turns the first person's hands while saying the password, which is Noah. And, and it's just, so they've made Frederick the password, and again, this is also in that other French text. I don't know. Okay. Uh, Knight's Kadosh ritual here. And so we see the same thing going on where it says, uh, it says the illustrious Frederick II, King of Prussia. And that's what's highlighted in this slide here. There we go. 
So it says, Chapter of the Inspectors of Lodges, Grand Elect Knights Kadosh, whose chief is the most illustrious Frederick II, King of Prussia, with the title of Most Illustrious Knights Grand Commander. Interesting part about this is that this is one of the two texts that I can think of uh, that has that little thing in there in Knights Kadosh. Normally, that's not a traditional element in these texts. The other text that has this is the uh, a text from Lyon, which they copied from Metz, which is a German thing. And so likely what it is, because it's a lodge uh, or German lodge that they copied this ritual from, um, they had this little, uh, you know, attribution in there. Uh, and they're talking about he's the head of masonry. Well, Frederick the Great's really not the head of masonry in Germany. But I think the confusion is, is that it's something like this is mentioned in this one particular text, which is actually fortunate for us because we can source where this ritual comes from. And it's probably from Metz and Morin copies it from a Leon copy. But did he go to Leon or did he not? Don't know. The last mention of Frederick the Great in these rituals is in the Sublime Prince of the Royal Secret. And that little highlighted part up there is uh, Frederick III, King of Prussia, Grand Master, and uh, Commander General, is what it says there. What's important to note about uh, the Balo manuscript, too, is you're looking right now at the oldest copy of what becomes today the 32nd degree. And under the order of the Royal Secret was uh, the 25th degree. And so what we're seeing here. It is the, is a really important document it was that you're taking a look at right here. Um, one of the interesting things, too, is that in Balo, there's a full-size uh, tracing board, but we'll talk about that later. That's also the original tracing board for the system. So the original images of the camps are actually in this uh, Balo manuscript as well. And so what does it say there in full? It says, rallying of the sublime princes. It says, Excuse me, uh, Frederick III, King of Prussia, Grand Master and Commander General, with his army of sublime French, English, and Prussian princes, Knights of Flanders, and Knights of Scotland, and the faithful guardians of the temple. You know, Marin definitely writes this ritual. So if you look here, you're seeing that he's trying to have a unified system. So of French rituals, English rituals, Prussian rituals, and I'm not sure about the Flanders part, but uh, Scottish rituals or Echo Say rituals. And that's the, that's the guiding principle here, I think. So if we look at this uh, tracing board that I, I talked about, let's come back to it. Um, it's engraved sometime around 1764 in St. Mark Saint-Domingue uh, Saint by a brother Perrot, who was a civil engineer. He drew several maps of the island. Um, he also has attribution to copying this because uh, he was the secretary of St. Mark, and so he copied um, the Night of the Sun ritual in Balo uh, for Stephen Marin, and also um, he's the illustrator of this of this uh, tracing board, too. We can't really zoom in in detail here, um, but it's, it's, well, I said that, uh, it's expertly done, and it's done with pen and ink, and it's a really, really high copy or high-quality copy. But here's something that's kind of interesting on it. Let's zoom into one of the flags on the camps and it's letter N is what it's zoomed in on. And well, let's think about this iconography. Well, where does this iconography come from? Well, we see uh, the first evidence of it in an actual document. This is the uh, 1767 patent of Alexandre Louis Delma. Um, and it's signed, if you see over here in the bottom, it's signed by Marin himself. Let's take a little bit closer look at it, though. We see the double-headed eagle. We see a lot of familiar iconography here. And so, you know, what, what, it's, what it is, it's, it's a composite image, and it's talking about all the different rituals in the system. I mean, you've got the hand holding the dagger up there. That's elect of the nine. Knights Kadosh, the two eagles, the Templar cross, same thing. Knight of the sun down here. You've got the working tools for the royal arch ritual here. And these different flags uh, represent some of the different things. You've got the axe for Prince of Labanus, uh, the key over here for Secret Master. And so it's, it's an encoded little image that has a lot of these ideas and themes inside of it. But again, it's the double-headed eagle. So even Marin himself, uh, we just saw going back to that, he's incorporating this iconography in here. But we need to ask the question, though, 
what's the inspiration for it. And so if we look at like where the thing comes from, uh, look at the Prussian flag itself. And this is roughly about 1750 to 1801. You see an eagle wing spread. He's holding a sword in his right claw and he's uh, sitting with the crown. So if we come back to this one, he's got a, a claw in the left hand, he's got a crown in it, but it's a single headed eagle. And so while, although it's not the same, it's a similar iconography. So then let's take a look at one of his regimental colors uh, in one of his groups. And you have to forgive me, I'm not certain which exact regiment this is, but the, the point is, is that all these regimental flags are the same. And the only thing that changes are the colors uh, the blue and the red portions will change depending on what regiment it is. And there may be a few other embellishments to it, but largely it's the same deal. And it's it's a crowned eagle holding a sword in its left claw is, is where we're going with it. Okay, so we've established that the rituals themselves contain the source of this legend. So we saw in three different rituals, um, in the Prussian Knight, we saw it in Knight's Kadosh, and we saw it in the Sublime Prince of the Royal Secret Ritual, that the Frederick story exists in the rituals themselves. But let's take a look now at the governing document of uh, the Order of the Royal Secret, the Constitutions of 1762. Um, in this particular example, we're going to look at the 1771 Grand Lodge of England and Wales Manuscript. So the first... Uh, little clue we see here and it's in the third article and it says the 25th of june the sovereign grand council shall be composed of all the presidents of the councils particularly of berlin and paris or the representatives to assist for that day in which the first two grand officers blah 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 and so you get the idea here that they're, they're, they're putting berlin here in the articles but what's interesting about it um is that there is a little bit more um, we go down to the next article, and so again, it mentions Berlin as well, but what we need to talk about, though, is that it's this little part right here where it says that there'll be one grand architect and one grand hospitaller and seven inspectors who reunited together under the orders of the sovereign of sovereigns, Prince President of a Substitute, blah, 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 Paris. Um, so what they're saying is sovereign of sovereigns, they don't say Frederick the Great himself, but it's an allusion to him. And that, that's where they're going with it. See another example here in the 10th article and in the 13th articles. And again, they're talking about Berlin and Berlin. So Berlin's in here pretty, pretty well. What's interesting, though, is that so if, if Frederick the Great is the sovereign of sovereigns, even under the order of the royal secret, so the very incarnation of this thing, so where exactly you know, does it fit in? And what's really neat is that the Philadelphia Lodge of Perfection uh, ended up writing a letter to Frederick the Great on December the 7th, 1785. This one I'm going to read in full because most people won't go back and read it. And so now we've got it uh, burned into people's memory here on the uh, presentation. So let's just go ahead and just kind of dig in real quick. So it says, most sublime and powerful sovereign, illustrious chiefs of the Grand Council of Masons, in the dignified and exalted rank which you have done us the great honor to maintain in your generous presidency over the two hemispheres of the great east of Berlin, allow me to approach your royal presence on a subject of the mo first moment to ourselves and on a subject which I would fain hope will not sound unpleasant in the ears of our great thrice puissant uh, grand commander whom I take the liberty to address. But with what language or sentiment shall I presume to introduce myself to so splendid and illustrious a sovereign whom we have reason to consider at the as the best, the bravest, and brightest of mankind? In what manner or what language shall I express myself in glorious renown, Prince Frederick III, sovereign of all sovereigns, the mighty prince of princes, whose Masonic fame has resounded through the universe as far as the winds have blown or the water rolled? The power of words can scarcely convey the distinguished feelings we entertain in your favor, and my humble pen, this conscious of its own inabilities on such a topic, flows in a gentle and trembling style. So a lot of puffery, basically. Possessing, however, every respectable and grateful idea which reverence can dictate and brotherly love inspire, pleased above every consideration with your sovereign guidance in the grand councils of the spacious hemisphere of knights and princes, 
I feel myself called upon as well from duty as inclination, as well from a desire to advance and propagate the interests of the royal secrets, and from a conformity to the regulations and establishments of the Grand Council in a compliance with the particular desires and impartialities of a sublime grand chapter over which I preside to acquaint our worthy and beloved brethren in the direction of the almighty Arch sorry, in the council convened at the Great Feast in Berlin, that under the smiles of heaven and the direction of the almighty architect of all things, I, Solomon Bush, grand elect and perfect and sublime knight of the east and prince of Jerusalem, sovereign knight of the sun and of the black and white eagle, prince of the royal secret and deputy inspector general and grand master over all lodges, chapters, and grand councils of the superior degrees of masonry in North America, within the state of Pennsylvania by letters patent from the sovereign grand council of princes under their hands and seals regularly established by the sublime grand council of princes to whom we look up with unspeakable reverence and adoration uh, pursuant to the powers in me vested have made, created, constituted, and established a sublime lodge of the great east of Philadelphia in Pennsylvania and North America aforesaid. And on the 20th day of September in the presence of a great and numerous assembly of the fraternity, publicly consecrated the same and set it apart for the purposes of sublime masonry forever. Now he's, uh, puffery aside, he's establishing his credentials and he's, he's asking uh, Frederick for his guidance. So basically it's a clue that they're, they're not being really centrally led in Philadelphia at this point. He says, he, he continues and says, considering our infant situation and a young and rising empire, distant and remote as we are from the great east of Berlin, we feel ourselves peculiarly anxious, uniformly to comply with and pay a strict adherence to those stat sorry, salutary rules and wise regulations which have been framed in concern for our better government, and not undeservedly have rose masonry, sublime masonry, to a commanding eminence which may be envied but cannot be overreached. For this purpose, we most humbly solicit your Masonic intercourse as correspondence to direct us in such a manner that we may not abuse the old landmarks or deviate from that regard, which is so just due to the will of our sovereigns and the measures they lay down for our regulations. As these intercourses are essentially necessary to promote the grand ends of every Masonic union, so we venture to hope without presumption that the great light of Berlin will condescend to shine upon us and dispel those mists of darkness, which from a distance of situation and local circumstances may otherwise surround us. So basically give us the light. We don't really know what's going on here. Agreeably to the rules in our grand council, I now enclose you a list of our members of our lodge in a prescribed form. We wish the grand council every success and prosperity in their illustrious pursuits for the honor and stability of the royal secrets, and wishing you, most respectable sovereign, that serene happiness and felicity which should adorn the remainder of your venerable days and gild the future prospects of our welfare. I remain with the most sincere respect, love, and esteem, your very humble and most affectionate brother, Solomon Bush. So a lot of words right there, but so what we, what we glean from this is they've set up a lodge of perfection in Philadelphia, they don't appear to be getting good instruction or it doesn't appear to be centrally led. And so reverting to the documents in their possession, particularly uh, the sublime prince of the Royal secret ritual, it's the one who calls Fred him Frederick the um, third. Let me go back to a couple ones here. And so you see it here where it's talking about Frederick the third. And it was also the only place it's mentioned that way is in sublime prince of the Royal secret, which happens to be their top degree here. So we're, what we're seeing is the the legend itself rooted in the rituals, and but now it's and then it's codified in the constitutions of 1762, though ambiguously. And now we see it being acted upon in lack of proper uh, instruction and leadership. Now let's bring this to the point of the constitutions of 1786, and if we'll recall that these are the governing constitutions for the ancient and accepted Scottish rite. So we're going to take a look at Article 12 here, and it says the Supreme Council will exercise the sovereign Masonic powers with which His Majesty Frederick II of Prussia was invested whenever it may be appropriate to protest against the patents of deputy inspectors as illegal. Information, therefore, there will be sent to all Supreme Council 
what we see here is that it says was, and this is printed in 1832. So the first, this is the first time we see anything of the constitutions of 1786. And what ends up happening is that it says was in this uh, particular example here. So what they're saying would, would, would include that this document is written long after the foundation of the Scottish Rite, and that it's a what we're seeing here is an evolution of the text. So then we take a look here at the version that's printed in 1859 of the Latin Constitutions, uh, which I translated. And what we see is that a grand consistory of Prince Masons of the Royal Secret of the 32nd degree may elect one of its own uh, degree to be president, but in no case whatsoever shall any of the acts of such consistory have force without previous sanction of the Supreme Council of the 33rd degree which upon the death of his august majesty, the king most puissant monarch, universal commander of the order, will inherit the supreme Masonic authority to be exercised by it throughout the state, kingdom, or empire for which it was constituted. And so we see the text is a little bit further developed here. Um, so kind of stepping back for a second here, as far as uh, the constitutions of 1786, the first printed version is a much simpler form. We see a much more developed form uh, printed in 1859, and it's a Latin version. And we see a little bit more evolution of the story here. The article has shifted uh, from, and then, there we go, uh, from Article 12 to Article, uh, Article 8 in this particular one. And so we're seeing a reorganization of the text. And so these constitutions of 1786, what we see in that first clue is that clearly they were written after the death of Frederick the Great, and then they are further evolved, is, what is basically the idea. So it really begs the question, though, what purpose does this legend serve? What, why even have it in the first place? And the answer is, is that it explains the transition from the order of the royal secret to the ancient and accepted Scottish right. So when we, when we think about it like in a larger sense here then is if it's explaining the transition of the system, why is it necessary? And it's because if we, if we look at that other clue where we're talking about masons of the so-called primitive right, what they're talking about is guys like Cerno who were still running around uh, with patents allowing them to make uh, deputy inspector generals. And so the organization of the Scottish Rite itself has changed, and they basically need to put this Frederick the Great story away. And so what they're doing is they're taking this, this legend that organically evolved. It wasn't really codified. It was just kind of evolved here, and they need to put the legend away and put the power and control back in the Supreme Council. And so that's kind of what it does here. So let me see if I can unshare the screen. I want to jump in here too if you if we can do this and we'll go ahead and start taking apparently I'm not smart uh, brother RJ are you there I am I am okay you want to go ahead and open up for questions uh, first things first let me see if I can even do any of that stuff Okay. You want me to? Yeah. Am I sharing screen still, or am I you, doing my you picture? Are. Or how do yeah. I unshare this? <laughs> here, here. Let's do this. Yeah. Someone hit a button here. And all right. So um, there, I think I, I okay. got it. Perfect. Okay. All right, Brother Joe, I want to thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, mm -hmm. The first question chat comes from uh, Steve Adams, who says, did the earlier mention of the 32nd degrees occur before the ancient accepted Scottish Rite appended the degrees, or, uh, I'm sorry, of the ORS? Yeah, the Order of the Royal Secret. So 32nd degree is organized uh after the uh, foundation of the ancient accepted Scottish Rite, what I was saying was that, that French document was from 1732, um, and it's the first time they print the so-called Constitutions of 1786. 
although it's an archaic form of it. And so what they were, they were talking about those primitive masons, they were talking about guys like Cerno who were still running around with that system. And so this was a way that basically what they're saying is, oh, no, Frederick gave us this power and we're putting it down. And that's one way of putting down the whole Cerno thing. But more importantly, what they're doing is they're establishing that their control of the system while taking this old legend that organically sprang up and kind of putting it away and putting the power into the uh, Supreme Council itself. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, do we have other questions? And if you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself, uh, ask your question, and then remute yourself so that Joe can respond in time. Uh, good morning, Joe. Hey, Brother Fun. <laughs> uh, it did not uh, sound very unfamiliar to me. I'm, uh, my name is Francis Stockel, for the others. I am a member of the uh, Three World Globes in Germany, but also uh, the Grand Orient of the Netherlands and, uh, and the uh, Grand Lodge of Florida. Uh, we had already some uh, exchange uh, this week about Friedrich de, de Grosse, mm -hmm. who, um, who was not really happy with the, all the degrees in the, uh, in the uh, Scottish Rite, and uh, because he thought, you know, titles, royal titles were not common for the, the common people. Did you find out something about, uh, about that? I, wanted I, to put, I, I sent you something, but uh, you, you may have it already. No, I, I wanted to put it in the presentation, but I couldn't source it. it, it if, it's, if it's a true quote, it's awesome, because basically it's, it's what you're saying is that, um, you know, he, he never would have approved of such a system. And, and, the, and the, what would be interesting to me is if, one, we could find the actual letter that that went to Berlin and what he thought of it, if anything, I, that I think would be fantastic. <laughs> well, we, we have something, uh, letters uh, in the archive <clears throat> in the lodge, but, uh, you know, we are dark in, in, in Germany mm -hmm. and uh, so I, I could not reach out, but I'm sure uh, if we go this or next year to Germany, uh, you can have an insight in the uh, in, in the library, which is very interesting. Yeah, I'd uh, want to take Brother uh, Stefan with us and then go take a look and see if we can't find it. Yeah. So, but it's 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 very interesting. Uh, very interesting information. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brother, for being here. Uh, next question. And just go ahead and unmute yourself if you like. Hello, brothers. Can you hear me? We can, Brother Arturo. Hey, hello. My name is Arturo Sevilla. I'm from Baja California, Mexico, under the Grand Lodge of the State Baja California. Mm -hmm. uh, I do have a question. It's, uh, it's related to the phrasing of that primitive masons as well. Uh, ah. Basically, by differenti uh, differentiating from the primitive masons, could we say that the Cerno Supreme Council did have different rituals for the degrees that were not part of the order of the real secret? So I've been tracking down Cerno rituals for quite a while now. Um, what I will say is this, is that he, he, had, he had rituals more than likely for the order of the royal secret. I've also uh, got his patent. Uh, Brother Brent and Art have a book coming out, and I recommend everyone get it to the Research Society. Um, they had me uh, transcribe and translate a French letter that was um, a copy of Cerno's powers and authorities. Um, I did that one, and then I did another one for them, too. I found the original one, which is in the uh, National Archives of France. And so I, I took that text as well. And what was interesting on it is that in 1809, uh, Pierre Le Barbier du Plessis uh, of Philadelphia uh, – signed his patent, right? And so this patent itself was an order of the royal secret patent. So even as late as 1809, he, he saw this patent, but there's confusion there. So it's an interesting little side note. It doesn't authorize what Cerno later did. It's just saying that, yes, he was initiated to, at the time, the 25th degree, um, you know, sublime prince of the royal secret. Um, 
But what Trudeau ended up doing, though, was kind of playing copycat of the Supreme Council. And in a way, uh, the reason why we got the Northern Masonic jurisdiction is because they were trying to put down what it was that he was doing. The constitutions, an interesting side note on that, they do allow for uh, two Supreme Councils, but remember, it's written after the fact, and it's probably written after um, the foundation of the uh, Supreme Council itself. It would be interesting to find that original text, though, and see if there are two Supreme Councils in there, because if, if they're not, then what it, what it may indicate is that um, it was modified to allow for two Supreme Councils. And it's, it's funny, too, because if you think about it, why would Prussia, uh, not Prussia, but Germany only get one Supreme Council and each country gets one Supreme Council, but America was a fledgling country, not really all that great as far as like size or power need two Supreme Councils. So it's a clue. It's, it's a thought I've had, but I, I can't prove it to be honest. <laughs> All right. Next question. Thank you. Oh, Brother Leandros has a question. No. <laughs> okay. Um, All right. Well, going... Seeing uh, if there are one last call here for, for any other questions. And I don't see any and none in the chat. So, uh, Brother Joseph okay. Wages, once more, a huge thanks goes out to you and also to uh, Brother Albert McClelland for his work on mapsall.info. Uh, you guys can find this presentation. We're going to have it all stitched together real nice for everybody with the uh, Q&A and everything which will come uh, just here in the next few days, and um, we'll get it all squared away. So, uh, Brother Joseph, one more time, thank you so much, and I'll be ending the meeting here in just a moment after uh, anything you'd like to say. Yeah, again, thank you, brethren, for attending. Um, someday I'll get around to writing this thing up and doing it in a much more professional fashion, but I think it's interesting, too, to kind of see the documents themselves and, and kind of see side by side how these things grow and evolve. Again, thank you all for attending this morning. Allow me the privilege and the opportunity to address you this morning. And I wish you guys a great, happy, and prosperous day. And let's go out there and change the world. Wonderful. Great call to action. And uh, thank you all, everybody. See you next time. Take care, guys.